Hello everyone and welcome here in Copenhagen in the press center of the Eurovision Song Contest. Tonight we're here for the second episode of the ESC Daily Show, a talk show in which we discuss the news of the day with the world's leading Eurovision experts. Tonight I have um, two interesting guests with me again. Um, we have Erik Bolks from uh, the international uh, OHE delegation from the Netherlands and we have Sietse Bakker, event supervisor for the EBU. Um, Sietse, to start with you, um, uh, you're basically responsible for a lot of things that are going around here. Um, how is it going so far, the first, uh, the first days here? How, uh, how is everything with the organization going? It's going actually very fine. Um, we are in a, in a very exceptional situation this year because we are not in a, in a concert hall like usual, mm -hmm. but in an old shipyard. And to turn that into basically the world's biggest TV studio with everything around it that you need for an event like the Eurovision Song Contest is very, very challenging. But so far it's going well. So far it's going well. Uh, they've been around here for I think about six weeks building up. Uh, just two weeks ago there was still a lot of work to do. but. As usual, uh, as soon as the first flights with delegations come in, uh, things uh, appear to be working out like magic. Well, that's good to know. Um, let's take a look at what happened in the days here so far. We've had three days of rehearsals here at the press center. Today the press center is rather empty. That's because of Labor Day. We don't have rehearsals today, but that doesn't mean that the volunteers are uh, free to go, because the press center is open for journalists who still are here to work. This is what happened in the days before. We've had rehearsals, but we've also had press conferences and a lot of jam sessions all throughout the press center. Here we see the guys from Finland, and later on we'll see a short jam session from the guys from Switzerland. Both these delegations have had very successful rehearsals in these first days. Everything going well so far, as far as rehearsals are concerned, and as far as all the organizations, as you said, the, the venue has been rebuilt from a shipyard. Um, but we've had some things that I noticed from journalists here about transportation. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? Because I've noticed that we, among other people, have had to walk a long way from the from the regular bus stops. How's that going? Yeah. Um, as I said, this is not a, a regular venue, and that means everyone has to adapt, and that goes for the TV production, that goes for us on the event side. Uh, and it also applies to the delegations and uh, press and fans that are coming here. It's a little different experience, but I think uh, we're heading for three uh, very successful shows next week. And so how about the next week? Because now it's only journalists and I mean, if we have to walk another mile, it won't kill us. But if thousands and thousands of people are coming here for the actual shows, are things going to get better? Oh, absolutely. Uh, when you have uh, 10,000 people coming in for three live shows, but also for the dress rehearsals preceding mm -hmm. these live shows, uh, there will be lots of entertainment uh, from the organizers, from the sponsors, all the way from the drop-off point of uh, the buses and the drop-off point uh, for the boats that go from Copenhagen to the island here. Uh, so it will surely be a fun experience and all we can now hope for is good weather. Well, let's hope for that. I'll move over to Eric. Um, Eric, you're here for the OGA. Um, we know that that's the international fan club, and we've had um, uh, we've had them in every country. You're here for the OGA from the Netherlands. But what exactly are you doing here? Because I know that you should do stuff in preparation of the contest, of course. But what is OGA doing during the contest? Okay, first of all, we're here to inform our uh, members about what's happening here, to get them into the mood. Uh, we report about the rehearsals, we report about everything going around in the city, the festivities, the parties. Uh, that's the first thing we do. Second, we are here to uh, hand out the tickets for the people who order ticket packages. Yeah, because I noticed that um, uh, people got something when they ordered it, but it's not the actual tickets, it's like vouchers. What exactly is happening with that now? Well, they bought a voucher and with that they can come here to certain points in the city or at the arena and we will get hand out the tickets to the people. Uh, the difficulty is only that they will be here at several times, some coming only on Thursday or Saturdays, but some will be here on Monday, so we have to be here every day to hand out the tickets and change the vouchers for the real tickets. Mm -hmm. And what's your job in all of this? What's your main thing? Well, I have to be there to, to give the tickets and I'm also editing for the website. For the website, yeah. alright, yes, okay. Well, um, um, so far so good, we know what you guys have been doing here. Um, let's move over to the contest, because we've had a couple of um, interesting and, and you know controversial uh, issues so far. 
um, um, first of all, there was some news recently, and I want to uh, get back to that, because we've had, of course, a lot of issues with Ukraine and Russia in the build-up to this contest, and that drags on to everything, not just to politics, but also to the Eurovision Song Contest. The political crisis in Crimea may also influence the outcome of the Eurovision Song Contest this year. Will people give Ukraine sympathy votes, or will Russia not vote for the neighbor because of the conflict? And on the other hand, will juries or televoters ignore Russia because they are not happy with their actions? Or will it not play a part at all, since your vision should be about music and not about politics? Fact is that the people in Crimea are able to televote this year and that their votes will be counted for the Ukrainian televote. Host Broadcast DR has confirmed that on their official website, but perhaps. Is it more difficult than ever this year to keep politics and Eurovision apart from each other? So, Sietse Bakker, is it more difficult than ever to separate politics from the Eurovision Song Contest this year? What, what I see over the past weeks is a tendency of uh, fans and journalists to connect a geopolitical event mm -hmm. with an entertainment event. Uh, I think that's a natural thing to do, but if you look at the facts, uh, Ukraine and Russia are in one semi-final. They have their dressing rooms less than 20 meters apart. Uh, the most members of the delegations know each other, have worked with each other for many years. Uh, and the atmosphere behind the scenes is uh, just as usual. Um, when it comes to, uh, to the televoting, this is merely a technical issue. Um, Crimea um, uh, has a Ukrainian telephone network uh, and our voting goes through uh, the telephone companies. Uh, so the people in Crimea uh, will vote through Ukrainian telecom network and thereby their votes will count for Ukraine. Mm -hmm. um, and so how will this exactly think? Because you're talking about the delegations and I'm, I'm pretty sure that if they know each other for a long time and there, there's no um, issues between them, but how about the people at home? Because you don't know everyone, of course, that televotes and do you think that these things can play a role for people at home, these, these, these sentiments or something that, that could influence televotes, especially on, on, the, on Crimea itself? Well, I think that when people watch the show, there are a lot of things that will, that will influence their, their thinking, their way of voting. Uh, and I'm sure that what happened in Ukraine with Russia uh, over the past weeks, um, it can influence their, their way they're looking at it or if they're paying attention to it. Uh, whether it actually makes a difference we'll have to see during the show. Uh, it's up to people to decide how they vote. Aren't you not afraid that people will start booing from the audience because I've seen web pages boo your Russia at Eurovision? Did you take precautions? I think it's uh, it would be a little childish because mm, I, I am sure that most fans of the Eurovision Song Contest also would like to keep uh, Eurovision and politics uh, very well separated. Uh, booing would mean that they use the Eurovision Song Contest to make a political statement. Uh, the Tomatevich twins, uh, they have nothing to do with the political conflict between uh, Ukraine and Russia. Uh, and all I can do is, uh, is hope that they will respect the values of the Eurovision Song Contest. But of course everyone is entitled to an opinion. Mm -hmm. Well, once again, then I have to ask, because of course I agree with you, but um, uh, we've seen that um, even though we would say that booing is childish, it has happened before. Isn't there a reason to suspect that it will happen this year because of the things that we have been discussing so far? Uh, it can happen. Uh, we will then notice it during uh, the, the dress rehearsals. We will notice it uh, during the live show. Um, of course, you can do a lot with sound and sort of filter out the booing. Um, whether we should or should, should not do that, uh, that's not up to us, that's really up to the director who decides what the show uh, will end up like on television. And the decisions that the, the, the director and the producers take uh, are the ones that we will respect. Mm -hmm. 